You're listening to the Waypoint TV Podcast Network, brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors. Knives, machetes, saws, and shears, multi-tools, shovels, swords, axes, spears, hatchets, and tomahawks. If it cuts, snips, slices, or chops, Midway USA has it. Find great gift ideas in our huge selection of pocket knives and other everyday carry folding knives. Make a statement or create a family legacy with one of our top-of-the-line hunting knives. We've got a great selection of manual and electric sharpeners, too. For just about everything for the outdoors, check out MidwayUSA.com. Your teen requested a ride, but this time not from you. It's through their Uber teen account. You drive your teenager around a lot to their friend Jacob's house, their other friend Jake's house, to James's, to Jaden's, to Jalen's, to... Uh, Mom? This is Jake's house, not Jacob's. Now with an Uber teen account, your teen can request a ride under your supervision. They'll ride with a highly rated driver, and with live trip tracking, you'll follow along the whole ride to their friends' houses that all sound the same. Add your teen to your Uber account today. See app for details. Bye, Mom. If you hunt enough, you learn the truth. What you seek speaks a language and knows it well. That's why every Primo's call for everything you hunt is made the right way. We sweat every detail so you get more out of every hunt and nothing leaves our hand until we know it'll work in yours. Because we don't just make the world's best calls, we speak the language. Primo's. In 61, this is your boy East Coast Trev, and I'm joined always with my good buddy, Mr. Madman Mardik. What up? Dude, I gotta say, man, I'm gonna start the pod- podcast off like this, dude. Nice podcast with the fall obsession. That was a cool little podcast, man. I took the time to listen to it. I don't listen to very many podcasts, but that was definitely a good one, man. I, I was sounding like you had a, an absolute blast on that podcast. It was a good time. It's weird talking that much. Is like it? being the co- even being a co-host, you do a lot of listening because you're you're letting your guests talk. Mm-hmm. And then when you're the guest, you're like, I'm talking a lot, <laughs> <laughs> but you're supposed to because you're the guest. It seemed like you had a really good time, man. Some good, some down to earth, good conversation. Some good stories. It seemed as if you know it was it was kind of fun, and it was it, you don't talk a lot, so it was good to hear you, you know, and kind of you know the excitement and joy. We don't get to hear all that all that often, like you said. We're normally listening or asking questions. We don't. You know, we don't get to really share kind of our insights or stories as much as, you know, here and there, tidbits, but not not a lot. Yeah, for sure. I, I really like the topic of, you know, the old days, like when it was like, mm. you know, you guys will go, everyone go listen to the podcast. But like, man, I want to bring back that feeling of what it was like when it was a kid where like you just didn't have a care in the world. You just went hunting, you know, and. You know, it's hard for me because I I truly have a burning passion to chase mature bucks and play the cat and mouse game and doing everything you possibly can to stack the cards in your mm-hmm. favor as far as playing the wind and the thermals and all that stuff. Like, I, I truly, truly have a passion for that. But, man, sometimes I just want to be like, screw it, man. I'm just I'm just throwing a. I'm just going somewhere. I'm just getting in. Tr- I, I kind of did that opening day, to be honest with you, right. of our deer season. I. Well, we I both we both my, did. Yeah, I probably went to my worst place possible for for big bucks, and I'm like, I'm just gonna hang out. I'm just gonna get in a tree and see what happens. No, no expectations, you know. It's it's kind of crazy, Steve, because you know, and we, and we try to bring light to it all the time. Me and you always have the conversations of it and talk about it. And there was a time in my my career where. It didn't really matter, but trying to get footage or trying to get this or trying to do that and chase big bucks. And there's always that burning desire of what it is and how much fun that you can actually have and enjoy the outdoors and spend time with one another, man. Like you, you, when you're chasing mature deer or putting in scouting hours and stuff, a lot of it's done alone. And you, and you become that kind of loner guy, right? And you kind of do what you do and you don't get to spend too much time with friends in camp or family in camp and like dude I, I don't know how many saturday mornings we would wake up and go pheasant hunting and not a care in the world dude we're just going pheasant hunting or we're going deer hunting and you you know you get in that ladder stand or you hunt that one property that you go to that 
particular stand all the time. You didn't know about wind and thermals and you, you just you just hunted and you enjoyed it and there was no care in the world. Like yeah. it's just I can, I, it's just so funny, man. I can remember like having conversations with dad like, well the wind always blows off that hill that way. Oh, there was no talk about northeast southwest. Like I don't even know what way north was, but it, we knew it usually blew this way. <laughs> like, you know, it's like uh, it's just so crazy how much it's changed in what twenty years. It 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 is, and you know it's because it's a persona that you have to to like shoot for, right? Like to make mm. it look good on social media, and guys kind of like, why'd you shoot that buck, or why did you do this, or why did you? Who gives a flying fuck, yeah. dude? Like, I went hunting with my dad on opening day, and like, dude, it was it was tough, right? Because. We know winds, prevailing winds, thermals, this, that, and I'm in the tree stand, and I could feel the wind, and I'm thinking like, oh, that's not a good wind, not from where I think they're coming from. But, bro, I saw like fucking six deer, dude, and I'm like, yeah, who cares? This is a blast. I'm having the time yeah. of my life. And and same with you, man. You were just yeah. enjoying enjoying hunting. Like, yeah. it's tough to do, but fuck, it's the, awesome. The, the one thing that I do like about passing deer and not going immediately to kill mode every time i see something brown like i like just there was a time in my life where if i saw brown i, I was reaching for the bow it wasn't gun, all right? that long ago neither stevie no no right <laughs> um is what this the stuff that you see when you're not in kill mode right like all right like uh sunday night i saw a doe and a fawn and just observing i was filming right and like i watched that fawn i watched that doe the fawn actually went over i watched her milk you know mm -hmm. and just watched how they interacted and like how far she'd let that fawn go and then the fawn would look up like oh shit where's mom and then he'd come running back over and it's just so fun to just watch them you know it really is and you know it's kind of funny is so i had always been you know one of those guys i mean we had you know we hunted for meat. I mean, that was reality, right? Like that was, that was our life was we hunted for meat, but there was a time in my life where we didn't just hunt for meat that we hunted for, for fun too. Like my dad would make us like, I'd be like, dude, you're going to shoot that thing. You're going to shoot that thing. He's like, relax, relax. It's okay. We don't have to kill them all. And I'm like, no, kill them. Fucking kill them. Like, you know, but you get to understand what those deer actually do. Like mm -hmm. how they, how they react, how they, they do different things, how they, you know, and it's, and it's actually fun and enjoyable to, to do, man. Like it's, it's, you, you don't learn. And I say this all the time. The only way to, to learn how to kill deer is by killing deer. Right. But yeah. also to learn how to hunt deer is to hunt deer, like to be in the woods and see how they interact. Like how many times when you were a killer, right? I mean, you're still a killer, but I'm saying when you had that, that blood in the eye, brown down, like the deer would move a certain way. Like, Oh, I got to kill him now. Like I got to kill him now. But if you watch the deer, I'll be honest with you back then, he probably didn't get a chance to make that move because he was probably already getting shot. Yeah. But, but you know, they would, they would make a move and you would be like, Oh man, I gotta, I gotta shoot him now. I gotta yeah, shoot the, him now because he's going to do something. The encounters didn't last very long. No, no. And yeah. when they did something, you were like, oh, my God, he's going to fucking book. And then yeah. now watching them, they do that. And you're like, oh, he's just chilling. Yeah. He's going to scratch himself. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, it's yeah, just, yeah. it's definitely a weird, weird interaction. Especially, like, I noticed it the most when I actually started, pat like, the, like the doe and the fawn the other night. Like, I wouldn't have shot that doe anyways because she, she had a skippy with her and she mm -hmm. was still milking, right? But, like, when you start passing smaller bucks... That's really cool because you get to watch how the how the smaller younger bucks behave right. without you going into kill mode. But I'll be honest with you, dude. I'm going out of state this weekend to Rhode Island <laughs> at, with zero scouting whatsoever. Yeah, and I'm gonna shoot a spike buck this weekend. I'm not gonna lie. Really? Like, really? I might. I mean, I might try to hold out for a fork, but you know, we'll see what happens. Come on, Stevie. Really? We, we might see what happens. Who so, knows? So it's it funny. Surprise. Surprise some people. So I was I was packing and I called our buddy Eric Nelson and I was like, Hey man, any last minute things I need to grab on the way up or whatever and uh he's like, Yeah, bring Stevie with you and I was like, No, he's going on his hunt and he's like he's like Oh yeah, that's right. He said he was gonna shoot a fucking spike buck, and I said, "Stevie said he's gonna shoot a spike." Are you I'm sure lying. we're talking about the same I'm Stevie? <laughs> and I'm like, I'll tell you a sure? funny story about Eric Nelson. He hit me up a few weeks back about wanting to know what we use in our scrapes. 
And I was like, well, Buck Fever Synthetic, but, you know, I got it directly from Troy Pottinger, but you can get, you can still get Buck Fever Synthetics, you know? So he's sending me pictures like this one. I'm like, no, you want the early season green bottle and the blue bottle for the forehead gland or whatever. So this one, yep. So he orders it. He gets it. He sends me a picture. He got it. He sends me a picture when he puts it out. A couple of days later, he sends me a picture. There's a buck in his scrape. So just to mess with him, I was like, holy shit, it really worked? That's awesome. Like, that's a. Oh, oh. Uh, what happened? No, nothing, nothing. <laughs> I can't believe it really worked. He's like, screw you. And I was like, dude, that's so, like, I'm glad you tried it, man. Like, I might have to order me some now. <laughs> so, that's, come how, on. that's how yeah, we should do it from now on. Yeah, you're wrong, buddy. That's hilarious, dude. Absolutely hilarious. Well, I do. I, do you have any killer's corners this I do. week? Case and Carpenter. Duh. Killer. And- and Kaysen's getting into a saddle here shortly, so I I feel bad for the deer population. Um, by like next year, I would say he'll be ready to be in that saddle full time. And then, uh, happy birthday, Chris Bittman! Happy birthday, buddy! One of my faves. Yeah, the man. Any any others? Uh, I think that's all I got. Uh, let's do let's do a shout out to the the good boys over at Latitude Corey. Uh, he shot an absolute oh yes, slammer. Yeah, slammer. Uh, it was funny as uh, I was texting him just the other day, just just hitting him up, had some questions about some stuff, and I hit him up, and he I'm like, how's the hunting? And I just get he he had just shot the buck. And he sends me a picture, and it's dark with just the antlers. And I'm like, no way, bro. What a stud, too. And I'm like, oh, my God. And, and the whole story, too. I, I can't wait to see that. Uh, and Lane was videoing. Right, Lane was videoing with him. So I can't wait to see the production they come out of that. Because you got to remember the backstory with Corey with the, his uh, bad shoulder, I think it was, mm-hmm. and, and the uh, the operations he's had. So, like, what a redemption hunt for him. A deer's a giant, dude. Absolute giant. If you guys haven't gotten the chance, go and check out Grit. I know it's not going to come out until next season of Corey's Buck, but some really good stuff. Uh, they haven't started releasing the second season yet, but um, there will be some good stuff that comes from that. So make sure to go check those guys out. And while you're at it, make sure to check out LatitudeOutdoors.com. Use the promo code Outdoor Drive. Um, I think that the Ranger 22 is back in stock. No? Oh, it's sold out again? Yeah. Uh, well, the 11 but- was in stock. <laughs> I'm guessing though that uh, they probably just can't keep up right now. But so just keep your eye out for. Yeah. And you know what? Not for nothing. I catch it. If you guys haven't already, sign up for the uh, notifications with uh, Latitude because they're super good about. They'll actually send you a text message. Yeah. And uh, that's how I got some of that stuff before it went out of stock because I got the text message and just went right to the website and ordered it before it had a chance to go out of stock. So make sure to check those guys out over there. Get yourself your saddle hunting stuff. There is uh, the Lone Star and the Maverick. Uh, now they have the Maverick Mossy Oak. So there's some really good stuff. But make sure you use that Real promo tree. code Outdoor Drive. Real tree. Oh, Real tree. You messed me up on that because I said Real tree. You said Mossy Oak. I don't know what you're talking about. It's yeah. Real tree. Yeah, it's Real tree. So, anyways, uh, make sure to use the promo code Outdoor Drive on that one. Save yourself some. Uh, Huntworth. We are brought to you by Huntworth. The official camo of the Outdoor Drive is Huntworth. The new verdict. If you guys haven't gone and checked that out, you might want to go and do it. It's a super great camo. And then they just came out with uh, the by popular demand solid color um, Grayland hoodie. And heat boost vest. Like, if you guys haven't worn a heat boost vest, not a vest to wear by any means, but that is a vest to have. Like, I wear yeah, that thing when it gets I just cold. Whew, when I it gets track cold. It down. Did you really? I was gonna. Wonder, yeah. I was gonna ask you about that. Yeah, I got it. It I showed up. It. it showed She's up. In, it was in my possession. Oh man. So I got it in the truck for this weekend. Just because it's it chilly at night at camp. I, I heard you had some clean pants too that didn't smell like skunks. I do. <laughs> I do. Stevie skunk skunk for backups. That's right. Well, and also, guys, don't forget to refuse to follow. Go and check out Bowtech. They are the official bow of the Outdoor Drive. We will make them eat this weekend. Uh, go and check them out. Shoot them at your local bow shop. Uh, also with tight spot quivers, center mass stabilizers, um, rip cord, uh, um, Ripcord rest. rest. <laughs> Sorry, I was blanking out. Black and gold, or is it black gold? 
I was but, doing black gold sights. I'm actually super excited about that about them. Honestly, I'm running the two pin, and I kind of kind of figured that out. It's actually pretty cool. Um, that's one of those cool cool little things with the double the floater. Um, uh, but definitely really cool stuff. Also, fourth arrow camera arms, fourth arrow camera arms dot com. Go and check those guys out for all of your camera arm needs. Also, tripods. You guys are hunting from blinds. Uh, they also have uh, also a ton of really cool other stuff over there on their website. And last but not least, NorEasterGameCalls.com. Guys, they are finally in production, the Mercenary. We got our patent pending. I know I talked about it last one. We're going to have to get Mark on and talk about that. Uh, you guys will start to see some clips and stuff. So go on over to their website. Not any on the website yet, but they are in full production now that we have our patent pending. I know we had talked about it before, and you guys have been waiting. Well, deer season is here. Uh, you guys can go get a custom one right now, but the Mercenary uh, Grunt Tube is on its way. So we will break that out before November ends up happening. And uh, super excited about that. So there will be a lot of cool things that come from that. So we'll probably give a couple away and all kinds <coughs> of good stuff. So pay attention to that stuff from NorEasterGameCalls.com. I can't wait to shoot my Rhode Island Spike Buck this weekend and be like, couldn't have done it without my Bowtech, my Hunt Word. <laughs> <laughs> you won't do it. <laughs> I want to thank all my sponsors for this beautiful spike buck. <laughs> Stevie, you know what? You Two know year what? old button though. It doesn't really matter, to be honest with you, what you fucking shoot. I know. You guys are going out there and enjoying the trip, having a great camping experience together, enjoying enjoying what the woods has really got to offer and killing something is just just a bonus but i just can't wait to post pictures of you with a fucking spike buck i hope so man i hope <laughs> i might i might i might pass bass crack eight if he's with a spike <laughs> you know what steve it's, it's really we'll see man like i'll be honest with you i gotta find deer like this is i've literally never stepped foot on this property in my life so the plan is like we're gonna roll in friday night and uh, i think i'm gonna scout saturday morning and try to get in a tree saturday afternoon so we'll and see hunt, what happens hunt sundays too sunday too yeah sunday morning definitely sunday morning and then like sunday afternoon is gonna be like a toss up just depending on other factors right cool. so we're checking out of the campground sunday morning but yep. we have the option to you know, Go check hunt. out and then hunt till dark. But mm -hmm. I, I think it depends on like what we're on, how the action is, how the weather, you know, we're, we're kind of just playing it by ear, but cool. It'll be a good, uh, next week will be, a, we'll see if we have a guest, if we release a guest podcast or we're doing some killers because there's yeah. a lot of cool stuff. We're going to call it Madman and Seth in the woods. In the woods. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what you guys end up coming up with um it'll be a good weekend uh i wish we could all be together but that's not what happened so we're just gonna go out and enjoy the woods from two different parts and hopefully we got some good podcasts and a ton of content to share with you guys so divide um, and conquer hey when you see eric bring back some of that buck fever i want to try it out <laughs> see if, I'll, see if I'll, eric give him a little squirt in a jar for me give please. a squirt in a jar <laughs> gotta borrow it but um, try some. but yeah uh let's get on our good buddies Devin and cooter uh yes i said cooter um devin and cooter run triple curl outfitters big d and little d, <laughs> big d, and little d. double d <laughs> double d down um gonna talk a little bit of waterfowl because that's right around the corner we start here in october uh so it won't be the last podcast that we do uh we got another one dave Parrish. we're gonna line him up to come and join oh, us and talk sweet. some some cool waterfowl stuff too but we figured we'd get devin on talk about that we got some really good ones in the mix here. Uh, Bill Thompson from uh, Spartan Forge. We got um, Adam Hayes from uh, Red Moon. That one's in the mix somewhere. Hopefully that comes along pretty soon. So we got some really good podcasts, but we figure we break up the monotony and hopefully uh, some killing ones too. And if you guys kill something cool, maybe we'll have you on the podcast. But in the meantime, let's get Devin on the line. Outdoor Drive Podcast. All right, guys, welcome back to the Outdoor Drive Podcast. We have Devin and Devin from the Triple Cure Curl. What? What? What is it? Can you just just say it? Triple Curl. Triple Triple. 
All right, I can't speak tonight. It's all good. Triple well, curl <laughs> outfitters. Triple, triple curl outfitters. Like, you know, like like duck curls, like ducktail curls. Is that what we're? Yep. yep. Yes, sir. Oh, look at that, girls. Well, boys, thanks for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Uh, they're on short notice. I know we had a small cancellation, and you boys jumped right into suit. Devin's been bothering me for months now to get on the podcast, so I think we, we let him, you know. How are we going to differentiate between the two of you guys? Well, you can call me Devin from all the call him Devo. <laughs> Devo? <laughs> yeah. Well, my nickname my nickname is Cooter, really. Cooter. <laughs> well. <laughs> nice. So that's how it's going to start. <laughs> we, yep. we got well, Cooter and Devin. <laughs> that's what everybody calls me. I could, whatever. Is that what they call you in the duck blind or <laughs> you know, you don't get to choose your nicknames. You just get one thrown at you, and if it sticks, you're kind of stuck with it, right? Yeah. Right. Wisconsin, it's been Cooter. North Dakota was Devo, just like the band. So, yeah, I got a couple of them. Nothing better but than that. In the duck blind, the clients, after a while, were like, well, we got a big D and we got a little D. So that's pretty much what they called <laughs> us when we were hunting. Little D. Little D. Yeah. <laughs> he's growing up to be a pretty big boy yeah. now, you know? He's he's doing big things over there. So Oh yeah. I remember the years of Devin Devin running around all the shows and the time that he talked me into getting a dog and everything else, so it's Yeah, you need another one about about pretty soon. <laughs> Stop. Don't even do it. Don't do it. Don't do it, Devin. Well boys. Let's uh let's put this thing in four wheel dig. Why don't you tell everybody who you are, where you're from, and a little bit about what you guys do? We'll let you start, Cooter. You want to start? We'll let you go. Okay. My name is Devin. Col- My name is Devin Covert. I live in uh, South Central or Southwestern Wisconsin. I run a small business, owner of C over T Construction. I subcontract in windows and doors, doing heating and AC. Also now. Um, Pretty much just like to fish and hunt on my off time, and that's who I am and kind of what I do. You can go now. <laughs> I'll go. Hold on here. Oh. Cracky. Look at that thing. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Devin went out. That You know, when, yep. when you're in North Dakota and you have no service, this is how this, this cookie crumbles. Oh, it's brutal sometimes. Ugh. Oh. I don't know. You talk to him, and then he'll be in the ditch somewhere. But anyways, go ahead, Devin. Can, can you hear us? Are you back again? You're gonna you're gonna ruin this whole podcast in the first five now? minutes. Nope. There, there it is. is. You're good. There yeah, you go. I'm back. I'm in the middle of the yard now. Um, Devin Tumla. I'm located in North Central North Dakota. Um, and uh, I started farming with some cousins of mine now. Um. Raise and train hunt dogs, do a lot of narcotic dog prep work. A couple of years, me and my cousin Cooter, we started uh, guiding for uh, Mouse River Outfitters, and then we decided it was time to go on and do our own thing, and that's where we're at now. So what made you guys dig into the whole waterfowl thing? I know that, you know, we've talked to a couple of people like Ryan Warden and stuff. It's one of those trades that's that's a tough a tough one when you're guiding when it comes to waterfowl and all the federal laws and regulations. Cooter, you better take it. I mean, yeah. It it can it can be tough. I mean, you kind of that's why what's nice about North Dakota is when you get your foot in the door, um, and go guide for an outfitter, you start seeing all the the legalities to it, kind of what you're doing. I mean, I've hunted with my dad since I was a little kid, so just doing it, it you kind of follow suit and you kind of know what to do, but then the legalities and everything that has to come into it to start doing it on your own, I mean, it's a lot of stuff. That's why it's nice to, that they have it where you have to work with somebody for two years before you can go on your own or even think about it. Is that is that how they regulate it? Like you have to you have to do it with another outfitter for a certain amount of time before you can get going on your own. Yes, you have to work with an outfitter, a, a, a outfitter for the state for a minimum of two years. Then you can go on your own. Um, but then you have to uh, you you work for two years, 
after you take a test, you got to take a test first. You have to pass that in order to even work for an outfitter. And then uh, once you get the job with them, you work your two years, then you basically get your liability insurance. You can then you s apply for an outfitter license. And then when they give you that, then you're set to go on your own. That's crazy. So, so what made you guys want to do this stuff on your own? I mean, it's a lot to take on and get clients and, and that kind of thing. The 1911 is one of the most iconic firearms in history. Designed by John Browning, the 1911 was the standard issue sidearm of the U.S. military from 1911 to 1985. While Colt produced the original, almost every major firearm company has produced its own version. It's wildly revered for its reliability, crisp trigger, and is still a favorite for all types of shooters. Whether you're looking to buy or build a 1911 and just about everything for guns, log on to MidwayUSA.com. Traveling to see your fave sports team is cool, but traveling with Amex Platinum for the big game is even better. Right this way. With access to dedicated card member entrances at select events, you can skip the line. And one. And with access to the Centurion Lounge, he shoots a three. You can catch the next game on the way home. That's the powerful backing of American Express. Terms apply. Learn more at americanexpress.com slash with Amex. Card member entrance access not limited to Amex Platinum card. The only shooting stick with one-handed trigger pull adjustments has a new way to keep you at the top of your game. The Trigger Stick Apex. Built for sturdy support that adapts to unforgiving terrain with easy adjustments to make your big shots. With our Durasteady three-piece carbon leg design, an interchangeable rock solid clamp. Nothing tops the Apex. The Trigger Stick Apex, only from Primos. Uh, to me, we hunted really well together when we first kind of met because I didn't even know we were related right away, to be honest with you guys. Um, just kind of met and hung out, hunted together, hunt really well together. Um, like I said, I've done it for a very long time with, I mean, started with my dad, hunted with some uncles in the past. Other cousins kind of just did it, and I said, hey, should we should we do this? Should we jump into this and try it? And here we are today, jumping in and trying it. So so kind of take us through what, what a North Dakota uh, waterfowl season looks like. Um, Devin, you can, you can fill him in now. <laughs> if he's, Am I back if he's now? in. You're back. Are you Sorry. back? <laughs> I'm back he's now. Back. Sorry, what? Is that Trevor? Good. Let us let it rip. We want to know what what does it look like in a North Dakota hunting season? Uh, just waterfowl. Yeah. So, uh, we've got early goose that opens up in uh, mid September or mid August. Um, Fifteen daily limit. It's it's pretty hit or miss up here. It's pretty rough to to get on early geese just because of crop harvest. Um, you know, there'll be guys, Fargo, Bismarck, Jamestown area along the rivers where that crop is in so much earlier, where they're out banging birds right away, you know, large numbers, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 birds, you know, um, up here because of, you know, the hatches are usually later. The harvest is usually a little bit delayed. So when early goose opens up here, you know, if we're shooting 10, 15 birds, that's, that's not a bad hunt at all. Um, we don't get early teal or anything like that. Uh, our crane season does open up mid-September. Um, I've never had great luck uh, getting on them right away in the season. Same thing. It comes down to a migration thing and a, a harvest standpoint. And then regular season opens up usually the last weekend to second last weekend of September. Um, the birds are just crazy the the first week of resident waterfowl is just out of this world it's crazy 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 and, and then there's kind of the first push push of birds uh the following weekend when non-resident opens up the locals are usually a little scattered a little finicky but you can definitely tell that the newer birds are in and then from there mid-season it it varies every year you know it depends on what's happening north of us up in canada being we're so close to the border you know we're basically canada so it really we really rely a lot on the colder weather hitting on time to create that steady push of birds throughout october 
Uh, personally, where we're at, to get into waterfowl in November is pretty rare just because we freeze up so early because, you know, it's not super large bodies of water. Uh, it's a lot of sloughs, you know, acre to five acres. Um, there's no true river Did you just systems say acorn? or anything like that. Did you just say acorn? No, acres. Oh, I thought you said anchor. <laughs> no, <laughs> one, one, to, one to five acres. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it really, it really, our favorite, our favorite week to hunt, you know, we tell our family and our friends, you know, try to hit the third week of October. Um, that's usually when, when Cooter, uh, he only gets two weeks to hunt uh, because he's a non-resident. So you get two weeks to hunt. You can do a week split and then a week later, or you can do it all at one time. He usually doesn't get his license to kick in until that third week, just because that's when the true heart of the migration usually hits. And it's complete chaos then. Why, why, why do you say that? Because all the birds start coming down from Canada, and it just gets really greasy. And, and, and you guys are really, you know, you guys are pretty close in that migration in, in the first start of it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. The one thing that's nice, especially I don't, I don't care to do them too much. Um, the one thing that is nice, you know, ducks, geese, all of that is a, that's what I prefer, you know, ducks and, and Canada geese, but, uh, Cooter, he, he loves chasing snow geese. And the, the great part about that is, you know, we are the first part of the migration when the snow geese come down. So other than, you know, the handful of guys that are chasing them up in Saskatchewan, we're the first people that gets get to touch them down here. So I know I know Covert really enjoys that in the fall once the snow geese start moving down. Oh yeah, I got a vendetta on them little things. <laughs> so so explain for most of the guests that don't know, like kind of like how the migration starts. Like they come out of the tundra up north and then they kind of start to migrate down or, and you're not able to shoot them in the spring coming back up. Right. Uh, just the snow geese, just the snow, snow geese, geese. We can do, you can hit them in the spring coming back up. Yes. Yep. Correct. Yep. So in the spring, it's a lot, it's a lot different than in the fall. Um, e collars, uh, you know, there's no limit. I mean, me and covert could go out and just, smash as many birds as humanly possible um and uh that doesn't happen very often but you know when the stars align uh i don't think there's a better hunting that you can be a part of is than a, a spring snow goose hunt conservation season it, is it um is it a lot of lessers or graders that you guys are hunting as far as, as snows yeah they're uh, they're mixed. You get some graders sometimes, but it's mostly the, just like the mid subspecies of them or whatever. You get a lot of the Ross and stuff like that mixed in. A lot of the blue phase. Yeah. Like I know, I think over by the East Coast, it's it's usually just the white birds over that way. I believe. So you, so you don't we get see it. the blues over that way as often. We don't see as many blues, but we do see a lot of blues. Um, but we get a lot of graders, which. It is a little bit harder to hunt. Yeah, you get the big ones. Yeah, and they're a lot harder to hunt. Like getting, if you, on a good day, shooting 20, 25 in a day is like a knockout day. Like that's like like 10 plus 10. You know what I'm saying? Like that's the best shootout that you could probably have. I mean, some guys do a little bit better than that. But like, it's not like the Midwest where those guys, they'll shoot 75, 80, whatever. You know, they'll, they'll beat them up pretty good. We don't get it like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's days that I just start out wanting to shoot 25. And then sometimes you'll get 50. Sometimes you can... I haven't seen the 100 yet, but one of these years I'll hit 100. Yeah. That, but, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You get you get 10, like on a, on a bad year when it's all adults, you don't have a real good uh, spring hatch out of the, all the juveniles. Uh, it gets really tough to hunt them because you're hunting all wise adult birds that have seen decoy spreads from all the way from Louisiana all the way up to the tundra in the spring of the year. So, I mean, by the time they get up in North Dakota, they get a little tougher to, heart, to hunt. But now with the juvie numbers coming back again, like this year, I, I've heard from a few of my sources I talked to, 
is that the juvie hatch for snow geese is like through the roof this year again just like last year so and even just from pictures i see on different forums on facebook there's a lot of juvies with snow geese this year it should be a good fall and a good spring coming back around so what does it what does it look like as far as ducks duck hunting and stuff like that when you're taking out clients like what do you what do you do you hunt in like sluge ways like what do you what kind of hunting are you trying to do so prim- primarily uh every day we try to get our guys uh, a morning and an evening hunt um a lot of places don't do that you know it's uh you go out if you guys see a lot of birds you're shooting lots of shells you know you're not going back out in the evening even if you only shot half your duck limit what we like to try to focus on is you know crane and honker feeds in the morning because there's always going to be ducks mixed in we don't we don't care if we don't shoot our duck limit in the morning because we can go back in the evening to some of our lakes and some of our sloughs or you know whatever or you know another duck feed and hunt it in the evening but up here you know you can only shoot cranes till early afternoon and then same thing with honkers other than two days a week we can only shoot geese in the evenings uh you know twice a week so we really try to focus on the fields in the morning getting getting cranes getting geese you know ducks are a bonus in the morning for us and then you know because we're not worried if you know if we shoot if we've got eight guys and we go out and we shoot 20 honkers and a handful of cranes and we only scratch out 10 ducks you know we're going to go back out in the evening to go shoot the other you know 40 40 ducks you know that we would need for our limit we might not get them, but you know that's what we go out with as a goal in the evening. So, so, so you just you you just brought something up that I've never even heard of before. So, crane hunting and goose hunting, you can only hunt until noon or afternoon or whatever. Yeah, yeah, early afternoon. So, why do they do that? I suppose to help with numbers. So it's kind of like the turkey hunting here. You're not Dad, allowed get, to give them. Them. Gives them a break too, a little bit. I think is that because they've done it forever since I can ever remember even hunting up there over the years. They've they've done it forever. That's crazy. That's got to be some type of conservation move because they I, do it with turkeys too, where you can't hunt them afternoon. You got to leave them alone. And I know that like some 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 places that we hunt, they have like you know, resting swamps and stuff that you can't hunt in or stuff like that. But I've never heard it where you can't hunt them in the afternoon. That's kind of wild to me. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you bring up like uh, resting areas, like, uh, like sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. We, we've got, uh, two of them actually our main, our main area that we hunt is right in between two sanctuaries, one significantly larger than the other. Um, that's one of the problems that we run into really late in the year because there's so much cropland that is still part of that refuge, part of that sanctuary. So when the birds are still there late, there might be 50,000 ducks and 30,000 geese in the area still. The problem is they're not leaving the refuge because there's wheat fields and pea fields and barley fields, you know, that are within that boundary. And over time, you know, they've learned that all they've got to do is get up off the the ice hole that they're keeping open, fly a quarter mile feed and go right back. And they never leave the the refuge. They're like big bucks. They know where they need to be. So they don't have to leave. They know they they're smart in that. If they fly over, they get shot at. So what are they going to do? They're going to stay right back in the ditch. Yep, they know. And uh, I know you, I know you guys don't do it a lot over there, but um, – and uh, I know Covert does it some in Wisconsin. I used to in Iowa, but um, especially up where we're at, it's – how many times do you think we've actually trafficked birds, Devin? Oh, like actually trafficked them? Yeah, a handful of times. I don't, I don't know. Maybe a handful of times. Usually it's Maybe. we're chasing feeds. You like maybe you a handful know, of times, but it's usually feed hunting. You, you know, we've got I've hunted so many times growing up in Iowa and you know, I've got guys, buddies that are down there and all they talk about is running traffic, you know, get in between point A, point B. That works down there. You it it's almost impossible to traffic birds up here. It's so so, so Oh, you're talking about down where I'm at. 
I got gotcha. you. Yeah, no, yeah. I've, I've, I've done both. It's either we chase feeds here the few times we get out or literally run traffic, and traffic works here. But if they start getting educated and pounded on, then you got to go back to the feed hunting here. Like, or they just get super wise and they get really hard to hunt. And it's you got to wait for fresh birds to come because they just turn stale so quick. So, so, so slow it down a little bit and break this down for a lot of guys that may not be waterfowl hunters because we might have a lot of deer hunters or guys. Or I bet you Steve's like, what? What is running traffic? Like, why don't you break that down for us just so we kind of know what what exactly that is. So there, there's, we'll just kind of start at the beginning. We've got, you've got water hunting, right? You know, you're hunting a lake, you're hunting a slough, a river, coulee, you know, whatever. You've got water hunting and then you've got feed hunting, which is always objective number one is to find the big feeds because that's where you're going to have the most luck. That's where they, that's where they want to go. Um, and like I said before, you know, trafficking is, basically you're getting in between point a and point b you know you know where they're at where they roost and you're trying to cut them off from getting to point b you know whether that's a loafer pond or you know where they're feeding you might not have permission for it so you set up in between the two with your decoys and try to draw them into somewhere where they don't necessarily want to be and then you're just running like big decoy spreads to try and get them to go where they want to be yeah, you're not throwing out small, you know, half-ass spreads if you're trying to trying to run traffic. So, and and one of the things I mean, like in waterfowl hunting, like a lot of the things is it's guys always ask like, how many decoys should I be running? In what scenario should I be running them? I'll let you take that one, Cooter. <laughs> um, I mean, it's always different. There's there's guys that'll run 400, 500 honker decoys. There's guys that'll run 40 50 of them i mean it's a different scenario of like how many birds are in the area stuff like that um snows for sure it's a number game with them things it's big number spreads whether it's full bodies or socks or a mix of full bodies and socks that is a big number game with snows most of the time um ducks uh, you run a you run a dry field on ducks i mean you you probably want to run five to eight dozen full body duck decoys with some honker decoys or run, run them in the kill hole with snow decoys, full bodies because ducks like to go to snow geese because they're aggressive feeders. I mean, it's, it's always a, it's always different. I would say, I mean, some guys will sit there and tell you 300. Some guys, I mean, I know guys here. Some of my buddies here in Southwest Wisconsin have killed geese in early season with as many as six full bodies. I mean, that's and how shot, we used to shot their sometimes. five birds a piece out of three guys. They shot 15 birds. Yeah, and sometimes, I mean, and, and, and a lot of guys don't realize is that they're just aggressive birds in the beginning, like especially honkers. Honkers are one of those things that, like, sometimes less is more, you know? Like, if you run a little bit yep. less sometimes because they're so aggressive. One of the things we used to do always in the kill hole is we would do three sleeping three sleepers in a triangle. And I don't know what it is, and when you put it in the kill hole, they literally want to land on them. I don't know what it is or where it came from, but we put three sleeping ones right in the center of the kill hole, and literally they put their feet down right on their backs. And it's mind-blowing. Yep. I'm like, why? What are you? Like, I just, I don't get it. I don't get it, nor do I understand it. Yeah, we don't... <clears throat> We don't run a ton of sleepers, Uh, you know, situations arise where, you know, you always wish that you might have more of them than what you do. Um, I say the two, the two kind of hunts where you're going to run sleepers with honkers, the most is going to be hunting water Mm -hmm. and getting those sleepers put on the shoreline and hunting snow. Other than that, I mean, we we don't really throw out too many sleepers, do we? No, if like not, I, I mean, I got a couple, but I don't think we've ever thrown them out. I mean, when we, you and me would just go fun hunting and stuff, I had those ones, but there's only like two or three of them I ever set out. But no, I, I, I would agree with loafing, whatever stats, loaf like shoreline stuff, and then in the snow because geese always land in the snow and they lay down. It takes some, I mean, some significant time for them to melt the snow to get down to the feed in the snow. So that I could see that more beneficial, but um, 
I haven't done too many snow hunts, like out out in the snow, a uh, few. But that's what I've always seen just watching flocks of birds over the years when it's there's snow on the ground and they're still around. That's I can see it's more beneficial at that point, those two points to use sleeper shells. Do, do you ever do you have like your special decoy or something that has to be in every single spread? Uh, I wouldn't say a special decoy, but we've gotten to the point where <laughs> ma- majority majority of the hunts uh clients might look out at sunrise and there might be a pair of sandhill cranes sitting on a hilltop 200 yards away <laughs> why do you do that that? that that has happened yeah i don't know just just for fun messing around but you, at the same time they're they're one of those confidence things right like you know it's just like um when when we were in college uh one of my buddies bought a got a swan tag and he went and bought like a dozen swan floaters you don't what do you need a dozen for but what we started doing was that no matter how finicky the birds got if we tossed out one or two of those swans on the edge of the duck spread they they liked it better it was confidence for them that big bird's not going to be there if they're worried and so you know half of it's just messing around being funny you know goofing off and putting something out there doesn't really need to be out there and the other half is you know just for confidence see like when we you know dev when we see duck hunt we always have the seagulls in the spread like just these random seagulls they'll just be like in the spread danny loves to run the seagulls but i knew that everybody always has a lucky mojo or some defective decoy that they always have to have in their spread because it seems as if like waterfowl hunting is one of those things it's always just like good camaraderie jokes funny busting stones busting ass on each other like it's just a fun good time i i i've got a i wouldn't call it a a a lucky decoy necessarily but um so mouse river outfitters we used to guide for uh todd and then there's a couple of the guys we're pretty good friends with uh you know nick and nick and those guys and jared and uh me and ivy we went over to go hang out with them and do a little hunting and we went out to the bar and nick was just he was gone and his wallet was sitting out on the table so me and jared got his credit card out and we ordered you know uh a big uh 12 inch um adult toy to the lodge and that whole season, every day that they went out, they slipped it into a client's blind bag. And the clients would get out there and start reaching around to grab shells, and they'd grab out that sucker. <laughs> and by the end of it, they ended up, it was, they, they had a, a full body goose that they were missing a head and they couldn't find it. And they screwed it on as the head to that goose, and they hunted with it for weeks. <laughs> So yeah, not necessarily, the, you know, like a lucky, like a lucky decoy or a lucky aura or you know four leaf clover or something, but you know, funny stuff like that does happen pretty often. It's always it's always something in camp. Like I guess I guess as a guide and being around the guys all the time and having different clients come in, you have different spoofs and different funny things that guys do. Because I mean, let's let's face it, guys are out there to have a good time. I mean, Steve, how many times in bear camp did they have little tiny spoofs or something that you guys would do throughout the years? You know, just being in camp with all the guys. I mean, it's just a it's a it's a normal thing every single time you go somewhere because everyone's there for vacation they're there for a fun time they don't want it to be up you know kind of like stuffy and and not fun to be around yeah yeah <laughs> it's just... they had, i mean the client a lot of the clients we've had over like the years of doing this they're a riot you can kind of read them within about the first i'd say maybe 15 20 minutes when they're getting like settled in or hanging out and oh man, we said we Devin and me have had some dandies. Oh God, you're just sitting there, your guts hurt so bad from laughing so hard in the blinds. By the time you're done hunting, it's like, oh my God, you guys are awesome and so much fun to hunt with. What do you What so, do you think it, some I mean, of those it, stories are? Fun. Tell us some of those stories. I mean, those. I mean, let's share them with everybody. Uh, well, I think my, I think my favorite one was so <clears throat> I, I I I don't know. Covert could probably attest to it, but. I bought a water spread 
couple of years ago when we started guiding because I wanted I wanted our water spread to be the best of the best, bigger than everyone else's. I mean, like, I don't know many outfitters up here that really try to hunt water. Most try to hunt fields. But I would put that water spread that I got against anyone's. And it was Devin and these three old guys that we had, and they were from, were they from Georgia or South Carolina? I think so, somewhere over there. That is one of our last groups of the year, and we had been smoking birds with them. But uh, these two, you guys had, what, two teal or gadwell or something come sneak around the corner, and they landed right in the middle of the spread. And oh, it's two mallards. Two mallards. Covert, Covert goes, all right, you guys see them? Yep, yep, yep. Get ready. Boom, 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 boom. And one's dead, and one's flying away. Well, the guy on the end, his name was Ralph, and he goes, well, I got that one. And Govert's like, you didn't, no, you didn't. It flew away. He's like, it's, it's lying right there. It's dead. So Govert sends his dog out there, gets the one duck, brings it back. And then he, about five minutes later, one of my decoys is ass down, sinking down to the bottom of the slough. Just peppered. Just absolutely peppered a decoy. You could have not. You could. You would have never been able to tell that guy he shot a decoy and not a duck if you wouldn't have pulled that decoy out of the water. I actually sent my dog out there to retrieve it, and all I hear is like a plastic chomp, and I'm like, "What in the heck?" So then I'm like going out there because he comes back, he leaves it there because I mean it sounded like something like plastic clunking in his mouth. So I walked out there and went and grabbed it, and I'm like, "Oh." Nice. I said, yeah, you got the second one. All right. You killed a decoy. And he just massacred it. It was BBs everywhere. Brand new, basically brand new decoys. <laughs> oh, it's brand, brand new. First season. Hey, we, we let him take it home. I'm pretty sure he's got it sitting on a shelf somewhere in his house. <laughs> Do you yeah, he got pictures with, with Devin and me with it. And we're like, yeah, you're taking that home as a trophy. He goes, yeah, I am definitely taking this home. Do you ever get clients that want to, like, blow a duck call and you're like, oh, please don't do that. Don't do that. So we tell everyone that if you've got calls, you're welcome to call. But if you start hammering on them and you sound like trash, we will let you know. And there's been more than a handful of times where you have to tell guys that you can just put that away. You're doing way more harm than good right now. How do you go about that conversation, though? Like, like you're you're it's like you're the coach and they're the players right you're just like hey no to the bench yeah do they normally take it good you're like you, men or you're on timeout <laughs> pretty much is what how it goes do they take it well though yeah i don't think i've ever i don't think i've ever had anybody you know cause a big hunting boots are a critical component of any successful hunt whether walking a short distance to your blind or trudging miles through rugged terrain, your feet are carrying the load. Without the right boots, you could give up early and lose out on that trophy just over the ridge. At Midway USA, we make selecting boots for your next hunt easier. With just a few clicks of a mouse, you can decide on what's important, like waterproofing, insulation, size, width, and savings. For just about everything for shooting, hunting, and the outdoors, check out MidwayUSA.com. Friends of NRA is your chance to support our Second Amendment rights and preserve America's hunting traditions. Join Friends of NRA at one of our 600 exciting events nationwide. From games to auctions and exclusive firearms, Friends of NRA events are your chance to support a cause you care about while having a great time with patriots in your community. Whether you're a seasoned shooter, an avid hunter or outdoorsman, or passionate about freedom, there's a place for you within Friends of NRA. Visit friendsofnra.org to find an event near you. Stand up for freedom with the Friends of NRA. If you hunt enough, you learn the truth. What you seek speaks a language and knows it well. That's why every Primo's call for everything you hunt is made the right way. We sweat every detail so you get more out of every hunt. And nothing leaves our hand until we know it'll work in yours. Because we don't just make the world's best calls, we speak the language. Primos. Fuss about it. But I never did either. I mean, I'm not the world's champion caller either. I'm decent at it, but 
if they sound good, I let them rip. I mean, but some guys are better on duck calls than on goose calls and stuff. So you just kind of pick and choose and, and some guys are really good at both. And it's like, well, I, I just add a little bit here and there to what they're doing. If they're way better goose caller than I am, I don't even bat an eye at it. Really? Yeah. I, 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 I tell people the same thing that covert probably does. I'm damn good enough on the calls to kill piles of birds, but you're not going to see me winning any contests. Yeah. And and there definitely yep. is a, there's a big difference in calling like competition. It's like turkey calling, right? Like there's turkey calling competitions and guys that just know how to c- call in the competition, and then there's turkey killers that just call to kill. Like and then there's the same in the duck and the goose field. Like I'm no competition caller. I just call to kill. Steve, same thing. No, you're never gonna see the two of us on the stage trying to compete because it's it's not gonna happen there. But like, but yeah, killing birds is a good different. Episode. What's that? You and Steve up there, duos. <laughs> In a calling competition? Yeah, yeah. Oh, not interested. Not interested. It'd be a good it's episode, not, dude. Not, not at all. And it's the same with goose and duck calling. I mean, like, like guys, guys will say, you know, like, oh yeah, you know. I'm not I'm not I'm not here to win a competition. You know, you just you just know how to kill birds. There's a difference between presenters and killers. I mean, there's there's a big difference yep. between the two of them. And they they never they never normally mix very well neither. Like the guys that go and try and call competition in the wild aren't as good at killing birds as the guys that know how to kill birds. In my opinion. Yep. I I will say we've had there's been there's been half a dozen or a dozen guys that you get out there the first morning and you get the first flock of ducks coming in and they start hammering on your duck call and you're kind of like, holy shit, I, I never get to hunt with anybody that can call a halfway decent. So I'm, I'll, be, I'll they'll start hammering and we'll kill birds and I'll be, I'll look down the blind. They'll be like, just keep doing what you're doing. Don't, don't even think about putting them away. You know, <laughs> Yep. All of my buddies up here that I hunt with, not a one of them. I don't even know if they own a call. Sean, Sean Sukup, I'm calling you out. You're going to listen to this. I'm calling you out. <laughs> 13 years we've been hunting, and I don't know if you've ever blown a call in the blind. Well, I guess no better place than to call out your buddy than on a podcast <laughs> telling him that he sucks. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll call out one more. We'll call out one more. Austin Hills, don't bring your calls up here, buddy. Don't bring your calls. You know Austin's gonna listen too. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> if you guys don't know what that is, that that's what rattles your antlers. So what better, what better than than to break into our new segment? What rattles your antlers? Tell me what rattles your guys' antlers. Well, we know Devin. When things don't go right, damn calls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and well, no, I don't get I don't get super mad with, about calls. It's just when you, you know you put the effort, you put the time into everything, and there's times that things don't work out the way you want it to work. But you know damn well at the end of the day, you gave it all you had, and you know it, it is what it is. It's whether the birds have been pressured and didn't want to work that day. Or just, I mean, it, it happens. It's you're at the end of the day, you're still hunting. And a lot of people that do the, the guided hunts and stuff, some guys are really good about it. Some guys aren't so much good about it. Like, you know, I, I paid this amount of money to come and kill stuff. Well, it's still hunting at the end of the day. And yeah. I mean, that's to me, I get more frustrated than anything. So I could say that's what rattles my antlers is when you have that bad day or bad morning or bad evening and, and you just, kind of beat yourself up about it but there's nothing you can do about it it was the birds that didn't want to work you- uh, i'll i'll kind of piggyback off that same thing you know is is you know you always get remarks about you know you've got a group of seven guys that come up and hunt for four days i mean there's that's a large amount of money getting thrown around and you know you can't help oh it's downpouring for two of the four days or you know it's nice up in Canada, it's 70 degrees up in Saskatchewan. So the birds aren't pushing down you. It's, you know, we go as hard as we can. We scout hundreds of miles a day and you always get the clients that, you know, like he said, at the end of the day, it's still hunting. We can't make the birds be here, you know, 
But <clears throat> I think the thing that bugs me the most is when you've got a plan all lined up, you know, this hunt goes this way, we're going to go do this. And you start getting to that point where you're going to swap your plans around and clients, you know, at the end of the day, you're not necessarily, you need to do what they, what they want to do, but at the same time, you know, they're your customer. So you've got to appease to them and make them happy. So if they don't want to go with the plan all the time, sometimes that's what you got to do. For instance, we had a spot that we were keeping in our back pocket a couple of years ago that was just loaded to the gills with widgeon just loaded backup plan right we went and hunted probably 35 minutes southwest of my farm and we had a big group of guys we went out there and it was it was just slow 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 hard setup i mean we had we had to hike in all the chairs the a frames a few dozen decoys all the mojos what four or five hundred yards to the cattails yeah it was a long ways it was long. I mean, it was it was forty degrees out, and I all I was wearing was my waders. I mean, I sweat through my shirt, my sweatshirt. I mean, it was we were just roasting trying to get set, and we're like, it's either gonna be up here or it's gonna be way down here. I mean, this hunt's gonna be one or the other. There's gonna be no in between. Well, it went the lesser, so we had a backup plan in case that happened. Well, pickup time comes, and. These guys were dead set that they're up here, they're paying money, and we sat there all day. Eight guys, and, I mean, it was just a rough day. It was raining all day. It was blowing 35-mile-an-hour wind. The wind switched, so it was blowing right in our face in the afternoon. I mean, it was just not prime scenario. You know, I have all the confidence in the world that if we would have went to our backup spot, we would have damn near finished our limit instead of sitting out there soaking wet, nothing to eat, nothing to drink all day, you know? So that's, that's what bugs me is, you know, just, just guys, just being bullheaded, you know, not willing to, you know, switch things up and, and do what might be best. So that's one of my biggest pet peeves is guiding the guide, right? So like if the guide tells you what to do, he knows best, like let him do it. Put that, put that faith in your guide, right? Like if you say like, all right, this ain't went pan, panning out to what it needs to be. I got a different plan. Like, let's do it. You know, like, you know, I guided fishing trips forever, and it was the same thing. Guys would be like, oh, no, you said there's fish here. We're just going to stay here until they bite. Well, guess what, buddy? They might not bite, but I got another plan. Like, let's run down the road, and let's see if we can't find something else. And that's kind of the yep. same thing that you're trying to do. And you can't guide the guy. Let the guy do what he needs to do to make it happen. It's the most important thing when it comes to guiding and, and guy, but guys, you, you probably get a lot of stubborn guys and then you probably get some that follow your plan and want to do what you want to do. And it pans out and always works. Yep. It's a, it's a, yep. it's a tough yeah. battle. It's, it's, it can be win lose. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not a small guy and I was right there with Devin, like literally with no shirt on in my waders hauling stuff out. And these guys were, I think from weren't they from like Kentucky or North North or South North, Carolina yeah, too? Yeah, somewhere Kentucky. I think North Carolina. Carolina. They go to us with it being like forty degrees out, maybe thirty eight degrees, no shirt on, and they go, "You guys are crazy," and we're like, "We're like just soaking wet with sweat." I mean, this is hot. I'm used to this stuff. Definitely, uh, Devin's used to it. So we're like, "Yeah, we this is what we do." And then at the end of the day, I mean, by the time they were going to leave. And they had to leave on flights and stuff. I mean, they gave us a real nice tip. We did one more morning hunt, gave us a nice tip. They're like, hey, you know, um, they're like, here you go. You guys deserve it. You guys worked your butt off for us with you guys doing what you do. Worked really hard for us. And here, here's what we're doing for you. And the other thing was is that uh, the other guys at the other lodge weren't killing hardly any birds at all. So the birds we were killing actually... I mean, it it was we were killing birds, a few here and there, but I mean they're still killing. So I mean it it turned out being all right after after the end when it was all said and done. They were really happy with the hunt. You know, it's funny funny that I've kind of found over the years is that like guys, the most appreciation is the ones that you have to work hard for, 
right? Like when yeah, you have yeah. to work yeah. hard, you know, just because you're not filling limits every single day in the truck doesn't mean, you know, some of those clients take that stuff for granted. The ones that you have to stretch out all day to try and pinch out a, uh, you know, a limit, those are the ones that appreciate it the most, you know, like they, yeah. they, they understand the hard work that goes into it and the dedication. Yeah. Well, it, you, I mean, you hit that spot on and, and, you know, I'm not trying to sound selfish or, you know, talk about bad tips or, you know, whatever, you know, at the end of the day, you, you're doing what you love. You're making money. You're already making money. You're guiding your tip is just, you know, a bonus on the top. Right. And, uh, we had a group of guys, I think there was five and they came for three days. So they, our guys, when they come for a three-day hunt, they show up, say, Thursday evening, and we hunt Friday morning, Friday evening, Saturday morning, Saturday evening, and then Sunday morning. So we go out, and we shoot limits by – after two hours we – were, we were out of, the, out of the, the, the hunting spot within two hours of shooting light the first two days. We get a, just an awesome spot for the next morning. And these guys can't hunt for longer than, what, an hour and a half before they got to be on the road because they two of the guys had to catch their flight. Yeah, I think it was something like that. We were limited. I think it was something like that, yeah. We were limited with pictures taken, these guys in their trucks, before that hour and a half was up. And... You know, five guys, three straight days of limit. Like, you could not have asked for anything more. Like, it was just cloud after cloud after cloud of ducks just pouring in every every spot we went to. It, you couldn't get better hunting anywhere you went. And uh, I think, what, we we split 200 bucks? For three days? I think something like that, yeah. Yeah. And we've yeah. had... We've I think had, it's something like that. And we've had groups of eight guys that we hunt hard for five days and don't kill that sheer amount of birds. And, you know, like you said, worked way harder. The birds just, you know, wasn't cooperative. And, you know, we end up making six, seven, eight hundred dollars a piece. Mm -hmm. I think it's an untalked about thing. And I think it's something over the years that I've realized is like, I think that it's, it's just the sheer ignorance of people that just don't know right like it's not their fault sometimes and i think that they just don't understand the gratuity aspect of it like your guide is working for tips right yeah he gets paid a certain yeah. set amount but i think that there's a there's a point where in in that world that people don't realize that you work for tips and 20% gratuity is normal like and people just don't know like i don't know how many times like so in the state of Maryland, it's actually a law that you have to tip your guide 20% or you can be fined by the police. Really? Like, it's a law, right? Oh, so, that's crazy. So here in Connecticut, when you're guiding, it's a lot of people say it, and it's in our contracts, that it's 20% gratuity of the final price of your trip. So say that they're, hunt they're fishing with me for three days and it's $1,400, right? It's twenty percent of fourteen hundred dollars, and that's and that's what your gratuity is. And they tell you like yep. it's twenty percent of your final cost. And I think a lot of people just don't realize it's just like a waiter. It's just like a lot of a lot of that. Like we get paid X amount per per trip, and then the gratuity on top of it. That's how we make a living. Like people just don't realize that aspect of it. I think they're just yeah, uneducated sure. in that point. Well, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's completely different, you know, when, when, um, you know, we're guiding now together and we're splitting that total money where before, even though we were technically, you know, we were basically running the, our own show, we were still having, you know, that we were still just getting a cut, mm -hmm. a small portion of what, you know, the actual total hunt was worth. Hmm. 
That's super weird. That's that's crazy. So now that you own it, it's a little bit different, right? I mean, like yeah. So you know, you know, so yeah, you know, now it's different because your overall split from your your money from your clients is of a greater number, right? right? So if your tips are a little bit smaller on the smaller side, you know, it ends up evening out. Where before, you know, we're splitting a, you know, we're getting a small cut. And we're sharing that, and then we have to split the, um, you know, and then we, we we share the tips, you know. So everything before was on, you know, a percentage base, a smaller percentage base than it is now. Right. Well, and you own the business, so it's a little bit different. Yeah. It, yeah. Well, boys, it's been it's been an absolute blast. But before we cut you loose, man, why don't uh, why don't you tell us what drives you outdoors? Ah, uh, dude, just. Just the love for it. I mean, I've been turkey hunting, deer hunting, fishing for crappies with with my uncles since I was, you know, four or five years old. You know, some of my favorite memories of being outdoors are, uh, you know, being in Iowa on the back rivers and catching five gallon buckets full of crappies, you know, on little white beetle baits when I was five, six years old. You know, I've never done it again since. I've never, yeah. you know, and that's just that's just what sticks with me, you know, and, and now that I've got kids, you know, it's especially true, you know, we went out, I took my two oldest girls out on, on dove opener and I, my shooting was horrendous. It, uh, that's the, to say the least, it was horrendous, but you know, we only <laughs> shot five doves, but the girls had an absolute blast, you know, having them out there with me and seeing their joy for it. And even though we only shot five, five doves was a better high than I would have got if I was out by myself and I shot a limit. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree with you more, man. When you get back to some of those basics and just enjoy what the outdoors is really all about, sometimes that's better than shooting 10, 10 man limit with all of your buddies. I mean, it's just, yep. it's really enjoying it. Colvert, what drives you outdoors, my friend? Yeah, just the camaraderie of it. A lot of people like having like having good memories with my cousin hunting. I mean, like I said earlier in the show, hunted since I was five with my dad. Like I could stand up in the truck seat and go basically watch him kill geese and ducks and go bow hunting with them and all that. And just just the camaraderie of it. I mean, I love to hunt I like birds, turkey, like turkeys, pheasants. I like to archery hunt. That's always one of my big passions too um deer rifle hunting i mean fishing i love to musky fish i love chasing salmon on lake michigan because it's only two hours from where i live so if i can get out there with some buddies on their boat and stuff i mean we go we go hammer some salmon out there i mean it's it's just the camaraderie camaraderie of it all with the people i'm with i mean that's what drives me to do what i do absolutely boys why don't you tell them where they can find you where they can book a hunt where they can follow along and kind of see what's uh, going on uh, Instagram is triple curl underscore outfitters and our Facebook is triple curl outfitter. Um, you can give us a message on there. We've got our phone numbers linked. You can shoot us a message on media. Give us a text. Give us a call. Uh, email is tc.outfitters.nd at gmail. Shoot us an email if that's what you prefer. Um, We've got quite a few openings yet for this fall, and uh, we're just looking forward to having a, a, what looks to be the best duck numbers I've seen in the last six or seven years. And I'm just really looking forward to chasing ducks this year and uh, getting after it with the clients and covert. Fantastic. Um, and you guys offer full lodging and all that stuff too, or is it just kind of like a DIY style, or how does that work for nope, you guys? No, just uh, – so as of right now, we're not offering lodging anymore. Um, we did that when we were, you know, with Mouse River. Uh, it's just too much for the two of us to keep up to. Um, you know, more guys makes it easier when you're running a two-man show and you are got five, six guys trying to keep up with a lodge and farm and all that. It's just too much. Um, so right now, there's we've got a couple different um, hotel options, lots of different places to eat, and uh, we, we tried to set our, our prices to to reflect that, you know, so you can compare it to 
getting some, we're going somewhere, getting the full fledged thing, you know, paying X amount of dollars for three days for everything included. We tried to reflect our prices, you know, so that you'd even be on the cheaper side after you paid for food and hotel and, you know, a couple nights at the bar. Fantastic. Me and Steve are going to get on an airplane. When should we be there? You think? No. <laughs> Dude, whenever, just on Around opening the weekend. We, 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 we got some big, we got big group on opening weekend. <laughs> I don't know, man. The third week in October is going to be tough to leave the state. I was about that spring return on them snows. That Ooh. sounds like fun to me. Yeah, that's Stevie needs come to come do in. that too. Stevie do needs up. to get in on some of that. Stevie, we should plan a trip and go down there and do it. But the problem is, if is that, uh, where, where where's that season hit with your turkey season? Uh, I think it. I think it inter- intertwines, but uh, turkey season's lottery. Yeah, you got. Yeah, lottery turkey season lottery, lottery there. Lottery draw. But what you got to do, you got to, we got to get it planned out so that when you come up, that the coolies are running, and we can go shoot snow geese in the mornings, and we can go hit all the literally catch thirty inch walleye in the ditch in the middle of nowhere. Okay, that sounds more like fun, Steve. I think we need to plan a trip, dude. I think that would be a a good run and something to do we need to get out there and visit Devin. i think that i, that's, uh, I got one more question for you Devin. Please. little little d yep. little d it, it, <laughs> fact that cooter is your cousin like legit because i feel like <laughs> Dude, like, no after, yeah for real, like, for real legit. Know your cousin for, <laughs> you legit like <laughs> Like legit, I, I think. Yes, I think we're, you're, I think we're you're really, we're, we're legit cousins. Yes, uh, you're my dad's second cousin, right? Me, anytime me and Trev go to any show, Trev's like, "That's yeah, that's Devin's cousin. That's Devin's cousin. That's yep, Devin's yeah. cousin. That's Devin's yeah. cousin." It's like it's like some some back backwoods Alabama shit, but actually in North Dakota. It was, dude, he he messaged me on on uh, on Facebook. <laughs> And we were just talking about hunting, like meeting up. He's like, we know a lot of the same people. And I'm like, yeah. And he got up here and he starts talking to, I think he started talking to your mom or something and found out. And he's like, he's like, text, he messages me and he's like, yeah, do you know we're cousins? <laughs> it's, hey, hey, hey. Yeah, I Martin. don't remember who I talked to and was like, yeah, that's Rodney's, Rodney Harris' son. And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I'm related to his dad. So yeah, we're cousins. <laughs> hey, hey, Mark! They got nothing better to do out there with all that snow. They just, you know, they plow snow a different way, and, and that's about it. <laughs> hey, hey, my my dad always said, "Don't ever get caught in a blizzard with a woman." That's what he always said. <laughs> Why is that? Well, Why wouldn't you? I mean, not, if, I don't want to be caught in the blizzard not, with you, three burly fucks. If you're not ice fishing or chasing coyotes in the winter, you're probably at home doing something else. Well, that's why you got five kids, Devin. I only got four, dude. <laughs> the fifth one's on the way. Oh, oh, oh. Devin, you, no, better, my... you better get some new uh, tip-ups and an ice shanty this winter then. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> no, my, my dad always would say that uh, most kids are conceived in the during a blizzard. Well, I know I don't want to be stuck with the three of you and any blizzard. So, guys, for everybody else, <laughs> thanks for taking the ride right here on the Outdoor Drive. Hey everyone, this is Captain Steve Roger from Into the Blue TV. And as soon as I feel a little break from this heat, I know that hunting season is upon us. Actually, the first time I ever went hunting, a buddy took me. It wasn't my father or my grandfather. In fact, I took my father on his very first hunt. Well, Academy Sports and Outdoor Stores has everything to gear up for the field for less. Plus, you can shop a wide selection of ammo, shotguns, deer corn, rifle, feeder, game cameras, camo, and more from the brands you trust. Text HUNT24 to 22369 to take $20 off a $100 purchase when you shop hunting supplies at academy.com. Need a hunting license? Pick it up in-store while you're shopping.